So uh, good evening and welcome to this Warwick in Africa community event. Um, my name is Marianne Davis and I'm the programme manager for Warwick in Africa. If you're not familiar with the programme, it's a philanthropically funded multifaceted programme which partners the University of Warwick with schools in Ghana, Tanzania and South Africa. We provide a comprehensive range of support to the teachers in our 24 partner schools. And we also offer the, the opportunity to our students to volunteer in the schools during their summer vacation. If you want to find out how you can get involved with Warwick in Africa, then please follow us on social media and um, contact us by emailing warwickinafrica at warwick.ac.uk and we'll add you to our mailing list. So now I'd like to introduce our two fabulous guests. Uh, Lord Johnny Oates has been a member of the House of Lords since October 2015, where he focuses on climate change, international development and mental health. He's actually coming to us this evening from the House of Lords and he's asked me to warn you that we may be briefly interrupted if the division bell rings and he's required to vote. Uh, luckily, he can do so via his phone, so it shouldn't be a very long interruption. Our other guest is a great friend of Warwick in Africa, Milton and Cozy, who's had a fascinating and award winning career as a journalist, starting with the BBC in the 1980s and perhaps most familiar to us as the BBC's Africa Bureau analyst and correspondent until last year. So without further ado, I was just going to mention a few practical things about how this meeting will be run. So we'll start the evening event with everybody on mute and the cameras off. But when it comes to the Q&A session, I'll change the permissions and you'll be able to ask your questions in person. If you're feeling a little shy, then you can also put your questions in the chat and the chat will be available during the whole duration of the, of the session. So you can also put comments and reactions as well. Uh, we will be recording, well, we are recording the session and it will be added to our YouTube channel. So I just wanted to make you aware of that. And if you do have a question during the Q&A, if you could please make use of the, the virtual hands up um, icon, which is at the top of the screen, that would be great. So I'd like to thank you all again for coming and thank to thank our two guests for, for spending their time to give us this session today. And I'll hand over now to Milton to start the conversation. Thanks, Milton. Thank you, Marianne. Good evening to everyone. It's great to be talking to you from Johannesburg, um, which I might add um, is also still trying to grapple with the uh, infection rates uh, of the uh, new variant which uh, was announced by South Africa last week uh, and resulted in a big global ban just for announcing it but um, we are here uh, and we are hopeful that things will get better. Um, I followed uh, Lord Oates's uh, posts on, the, uh, on Twitter today and I saw he asked some pertinent questions uh, to the health minister at the House of Lords, uh, for which I was incredibly excited about and also um, very proud to hear the line of questioning because uh, what is topical here, even though we're going to talk about volunteerism, but it is also important to see a volunteer who's still in action at the House of Lords. Um, it's a pleasure, an honor, and a privilege to talk to you tonight, Lord Oates. And uh, it's great that we have a connection in that you spent some time in South Africa during the uh, uh, last year of Nelson Mandela's uh, first term, the only term he served uh, after serving 27 years in prison fighting oppression. So it's great that you spend some time here and you're familiar with South Africa and Southern Africa, including Zimbabwe. But I want to begin right at the start when you were um, inspired by Michael Beck, who is one of our heroes in journalism, when he reported about the Ethiopian famine in 1985. How did that report move you and what did you do when you saw that report? Thanks, thanks Milton. It's, it's really great to be uh, here 
with you and 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 joined if only virtually uh with with south africa um you you may be wondering um what the house of lords looks like these days given my my backdrop and actually i failed to to update uh, marianne that uh, in fact I, the votes were called off in the house of lords so i got let home early so i am uh, i am coming from uh, my home in southwest london uh but um yes to go back to your question um I uh, was, I think, 14 years old when what became a, a world famous broadcast by the journalist, uh, BBC journalist Michael Burke was aired at the top of the evening news in, in the UK. And I was sort of sat, you know, not paying much attention to the news. And then suddenly there was something about actually the way the um, the newscaster introduced his uh, report, you know, it was very sort of sombre and, and a different tone. And then uh, he he um, uh, presented this this uh, this um, really powerful report with amazing footage by uh, uh, the late Mohammed Amin, and um, and and uh, and and. and uh, a really skilled commentary which really demanded everybody's attention. It was about a, a tragic situation in northern Ethiopia where um, millions were facing from starvation. And it just seemed to me, age 14, that it was absolutely wrong that that should be happening when we were amid so much plenty in the West, so much at the time that the European Union was, was destroying surplus um, uh, uh, food mountains. So. Um, I, I was shocked and I just wanted to do something about it and uh, with the precociousness of a 14 going on 15 year old I, um, I determined that I was the person to sort of save the world from it. It didn't quite turn out like that. And you immediately um, decided to uh, commandeer your parents credit card and you thought you were going to save Ethiopia from its famine and you took off. What did you find when you got to uh, Ethiopia? Well, I think first of all, I should say, I mean, the idea that I was going to go to Ethiopia and and somehow, you know, help out, help sort this out, probably would have just remained a kind of teenage um, sort of fantasy. And and by just one of the accidents of fate, I um, my dad asked me to pick up something from his study and I went down there. And on the desk was a, a new credit card, which he hadn't yet signed. And he had the same name as me, at least the same initial. And I kind of felt, well, this is a sign that I must go. I almost felt compelled. And I picked it up, signed it, um, went and found my passport and got a bus to the Ethiopian Airlines um, office in uh, just the Piccadilly Circus. And, and I ended up anyway, um, as you say, in, in Ethiopia. Um, and I suddenly realised, uh, first of all, that um, the demand for unskilled 15 year old English kids was not really great or at all, but also that um, Ethiopia was then under a, um, a very brutal Marxist military dictatorship. And it was a pretty scary place to be. Um, and I think I, I, I learned that very rapidly that, um, you know, sometimes however much you you, you you are determined to do something and however much you try and however much you pray um you you can't achieve it and actually the most things aren't achieved on our own but by acting together with other people but that was uh, incredible courage uh, i mean young people get inspired all the time by various events around the world but i suppose the difference here is that you did something about it. You get inspired, you get off your chair and you were not recommending that anybody should steal their father's credit card, by the way, but you did something absolutely um, uh, actionable by being determined to go and help. Had you seen anyone, a mentor or someone like that who uh, made you want to volunteer to help others? Or was it just this, an intrinsic inspiration? Well, I had, I'd grown up in, in the church because my father was a, a clergyman, an Anglican clergyman. Um, and actually, 
he had performed the marriage ceremony for one of the actor and director to that daughters and which of that as you may know produced uh, a film gandhi in the in, in 1984 i think it came out but certainly the early 1980s and my father and, and and the family were invited to the cast and crew screening and i was very inspired by by mahatma gandhi and i i sort of saw that kind of determination i thought somehow i could emulate uh, uh, that in some way so i suppose that was that was an inspiration um but i'm glad you made the caveat that i certainly don't recommend anybody um taking their father's credit cards and and because the truth is it could have ended very very darkly for me and i was i was extremely lucky that um i was rescued actually by an anglican clergyman because the anglican church had a had a um, uh, ran some orphanages with the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, actually, as it happens. And there was a youngish in his 30s um, clergyman there who kind of rescued me. And luckily, I mean, I suppose he was about double, just over double my age, but he was near enough that he kind of, I think, understood uh, my motivation. And he, rather than just tell me I was a complete dangerous idiot, uh, which I which I was, I suppose. He said to me, look, um, you need to go back and learn some skills because you, you, you can't contribute at the moment. But if you really care about these sorts of issues, please, you know, keep keep that motivation, keep that determination, but channel it a bit more safely uh, and, and do it without taking your father's credit cards in the future. I was already enthused when I when I was reading up uh, about you that uh, the Reverend uh, Canon John Oates was actually a Fleet Street uh, uh, rector on a Saint Bride's Church. Um, so there is a journalism connection there. We always sort of uh, uh, feel slightly warm when you see people who are working in the journalism sector. Of course, he was a rector, but on Fleet Street, where else? <laughs> Absolutely, and I must say we, we we arrived there in 1984 actually, and uh, so the newspapers were all still in Fleet Street at the time, just as an aside, which was, at, and they were all the old hot metal presses and all that, it was a very, very exciting place to be and I really got um, that sort of sense of the excitement and the importance of journalism and the church was very, very connected with with with, with, with journalism and the print media. And I, I like the fact that you did mention Mahomet Amin, who I worked with as a young journalist many years ago, uh, and I'm still very close to his Operation Camera Picks out of Nairobi through his son, um, Salim Amin. Um, because quite often people tend to forget that television or news coverage or news gathering is a team sport. Uh, uh, you may just have seen Michael Burke in 1985, but actually there are many other people who were working alongside him to uh, spread the news, which uh, eventually uh, got you to uh, try and do something about it. Yeah, no, I think that's absolutely right. I think I think there's another thing which is a bit maybe a sad reflection of where we are in terms of news. I cannot imagine a report like that um, leading the main news bulletin. And back in those days, of course, in the UK, there was only, you know, BBC One, BBC Two, ITV. I don't even think Channel Four existed then. So you had three channels. Everybody watched the BBC News. I mean, that was the thing you did at six and nine o'clock, at six or, six or nine o'clock. And to lead the news like it did, um, was amazing and it got an amazing reaction of course led to band aid and live aid and um and, and really got the public's uh, sort of attention and of course your love for uh, volunteering to try and get your hands dirty to try and help people in africa did not start in did not stop in east africa uh, it came down uh, this way further down south you uh, moved to uh, zimbabwe why Zimbabwe? Why did you choose Zimbabwe? Well, to be honest, it was it was one of those things which is it's, it's luck rather than judgment, but it turned out very well. I uh, there had been a new um, project set set up, which was originally called Schools Partnership Worldwide, and it it later became Restless Development, which some of you 
may may be aware of, which is uh, an organisation of young people that operate in in southern Africa and the UK and different parts of different parts of the world but um, but in those days they sort of sent out um, uh, young people to go and and help teach in schools I mean it's 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 not a model you would want to use now it was a bit of a sort of remnant of colonial mentality but at the time Zimbabwe was eight years it was eight years after independence and um, they were massively expanding their um, education system and particularly the rural secondary schools uh, and uh, so uh, myself and two other um, guys from from the UK were sent to this particular rural secondary school in 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 um, in Manikland in the eastern part of Zimbabwe and um, and uh, I mean it's a long story but I mean it, it it turned out the school hadn't actually been built which was a bit of a challenge but um, uh, but again, it was one of those things where, you know, working together with other people, um, making some amazing uh, uh, Zimbabwean friends, and we we sort of got the school up and running. And um, uh, yeah, and I, uh, it was one of the the sort of most compelling experiences of my life. I think. What skills did you learn there? And and I like that because in the Warwick Volunteer Scheme, particularly Warwick in Africa, we do have young people coming in from the UK, from the University of Warwick, to come and teach in Tanzania, Ghana, South Africa. And um, in this particular case, it's not seen as a top-down approach, the sort of colonial power coming uh, to, to, to lend a hand, because it's almost like a, a two-way street. While a lot of people come to teach mathematics and English, um, over the years, which has been a very successful program, um, they also learn a lot. What did you learn in Zimbabwe at that time? I know you became, in the end, deputy head teacher, which was quite impressive uh, as well. But uh, what skills did you learn by being there and sharing your own uh, uh, services? Well, I, I had no teaching qualifications at all. I mean, by rights, I shouldn't have been there at, at all, except maybe, you know, um, carrying books for uh, another teacher. But, you know, there was a shortage of teachers in Zimbabwe and and um, because we had A-levels, that, that was regarded as we could teach. But of course, we couldn't. So um, most of the teaching skills I learned, well, all of the teaching skills really that I learned, I learned from the Zimbabwean teachers who were there at first principally um from the primary school because we you know when it when it was established as secondary school there were just three of us guys who knew practically nothing from england who um who were teaching there um but so first of all um i i i just learned um from those people and one of the things i really um, learned i mean a, a very dear friend of mine who was later the head teacher of the primary school but he was then i guess he was probably about six years older than me but he i said you know i really don't I, i've never spoke i've never taught before and i you know we've got to go in front of this classroom of 50 kids and he said to me well um you know you've you know we can sort of help give you support but the most important thing is you need to know how important this is for these students and you have to you're going to have to pick it up you're going to have to learn it you don't have any choice um and i and i remember that and feeling that sense of responsibility and, and understanding how much you know i learned how privileged i'd been in my life that education had been you know um uh, it's sort of just been there i'd never really thought of it um uh, and in fact you know it'd been a bit of a pain having to go to school and stuff but here i had people who really you know that was the great thing and it was the great win of the new zimbabwe um but i also you know just the amazing support that was given to us by the community uh in in that rural setting and remember that that part had been trampled over just a few years before by you know soldiers in the in the sort of uh, ian smith's like um racist army basically and in fact they'd been pulled between both the freedom fighters and the and the government forces in the no one so you know their 
their willingness to to embrace us and to support us as we adjusted to to the world um, was was astonishing and I'm glad to say that many of them are still very good friends of mine today. A few years ago I, I made a film for BBC News called Mission for Mets which um, uh, on the Warwick in Africa program um, and one of the things that struck me apart from witnessing the actual teaching the learning process where one student from Warwick is standing in front of a class with a, a chalk in hand and the chalkboard behind them and they're explaining um, all sorts of uh, quadratic equations and all sorts of fancy uh, mathematical sums. Um, what I learned it was towards the end, the bond that had actually uh, been created between the students and the teachers and the local teachers uh, connecting with the Warwick teachers. I, I found that quite powerful actually, um, that there's something that goes beyond the actual learning and teaching uh, at a technical level. It brings uh, a people together. I, I think that's absolutely true and, and of course uh, in that setting at that time to have you know these teachers from England that close up it was totally alien to most of those um kids and um I, and you know I'd never taught in well I'd never taught in the school but I, it was an environment obviously where um it, it you know everybody was was Zimbabwean and um and I think what we so we came from incredibly different different backgrounds me from a very privileged sort of white English background they from you know pretty impoverished backgrounds but what we really I think bonded over was a common you know a, 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 a kind of common humanity and and just realizing um, how how much actually we had in common and I um, you know one of the greatest gifts and I'd say to anyone who's going out to um, be part of any of your programs um, one of the greatest uh, gifts worth more than any gold and silver anybody could give me is that 33 years on I'm still in touch with many of those pupils um, and uh, and I see despite all the difficulties that they've been through and that they continue to uh, have to deal with in Zimbabwe they are united together they've got together in a sort of old school association they try and help out um, the pupils of today and covering sort of you know school fees and, and uniform fees and all that sort of stuff and it's it's totally inspirational really inspirational um, to me. And one of your former students is now a vicar. Yes that's right he is, a, he is absolutely a Methodist minister um, yes that is right Paul Niagomo who was um, who was the head boy in fact one of the star star pupils but they were they were all star pupils I I, I think the other thing that um, that I learned because of course when we arrived um, and we were we were shown around this very nice school that had been built in the 1920s uh, primary school uh, by the then head teacher of the primary school, a guy called Mr. Manuma, and he showed us all round. And, um, and then he took us to the house we were going to stay in, which was which was a really nice house. But it was, you know, concrete floors, and there was nothing in it. And obviously, there was no running water or electricity or anything like that there. And I remember he he said to us, uh, "When will your furniture be arriving from England?" Which was a bit of a um, caused me a bit of concern as we we had none. Um, uh, and uh, you know in one sense I mean you know those circumstances uh, were completely alien to me and we, we were paid Zimbabwe teachers salaries which wasn't you know a great deal in those days so we didn't have a great deal but I think one of the things I learned is um, actually um, how little you need to have a really positive you know experience there's lots of you know the things I feel I needed cell phones and you know all the gadgets I've got around and TVs but um that that sort of fellowship that we had was you know was was amazing um really really important uh, to me in fact there's a just right there there's a, a concept which um 
is quite uh, well known here in South Africa and Southern Africa called Ubuntu. Ubuntu means uh, humanity or humaneness. Essentially, um, Desmond Tutu describes it as I cannot be fully me until you are fully you. You and me are connected. And we see this, right, with this uh, whole pandemic, that nobody is safe until everybody is safe. And there is a connection, a human connection there that goes beyond social media and all the, you know, the click, click buttons and so on. That actually um, the greater force of humanity is what, uh, it's got to bring us together. And that is exactly uh, what you experienced when you were in Zimbabwe. And I, I, that is absolutely right. And that, that sort of um, spirit of Ubuntu was, was through everything that I, I kind of experienced. I, I remember very early on, I mean, we had no, uh, uh, well, we had really nothing apart from sort of, you know, our sleeping bags and a few other things. and. But immediately somebody um, came with a paraffin stove for us. Uh, the the local shopkeeper, you know, provided us with with sort of food and stuff. And I I remember um, Mrs. Majita, who was the the, um, the there was a couple, of Mr. and Mrs. Majita, who ran the, the the village shop. And she said to me, her son had had gone to England actually um, at some point. She said. Um, she said, my, my son is in England and um, so you are my children while you're here. I will look after you and um, and 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 she did, you know, and it, it, it was that was really sort of special. Um, so, yeah, great times. You're on mute. Can't hear you yet. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, great. Uh, well, thanks Tony, so much. Really, really, really inspirational. And uh, I think we're actually near neighbours as, as, as well uh, as uh, coincidence would have it. But I was wondering, um, you know, clearly your experiences in Africa have had a profound effect on you and the way you see the world. Um, I'm just wondering in terms of when you're in the Lords, um, what do you bring from those experiences in Africa, which is helpful uh, in the laws? Because I'm guessing it's quite a lot. Well, I, I mean, I, I hopefully um, it's sort of different perspective and a different understanding. And I think, um, you know, there, there's lots of diplomats and, and such like in, 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 in the House of Law. But, you know, they tend to sit in, in Pretoria or Harare or wherever. Um, and, and there's no, um, you know, there's no substitute for actually living in a community, you know, on, on the same basis as other people, not as some, you know, on, on any other level. And um, and so I've learned that perspective. And I mean, one of the things that um, absolutely enraged me about this um, situation this week is that in the statements that the minister made on, on Monday in, in the House of Lords about Omicron, there was no there was no mention at all about the devastating impact of, on the economy of South Africa and the other countries in the region, and that and what that actually means because it's you know it's not like there's some great furlough schemes in in loads of these places. That means people you know going out without food, without medicine. Um, it, it means you know catastrophic and just not having that perspective, not having that understanding. I so I hope I bring some of that perspective. Yeah, I'm very, very sure that you do. And, and when you think about um, you know, your experiences and, and you know, if, if I think of Warwick in Africa, this balance of risk and creating an impact, because to create an impact, it, it's never risk free. I mean, I remember our very first year um, in 2006, we were going to Alexandra slum in Joburg. I mean, it's a sort of risk laden environment, not a risk free environment. Nothing comes without risk, but you have to try and mitigate the risks as much as you can. Do you think in the society we're in today that, and, and COVID may have actually uh, accelerated this, we've become less and less prepared to take a risk to create a bigger 
social change or do you think actually because of covid we're now coming out the other side and and actually people are prepared to take a bigger risk and then that risk can be manifested in all sorts of ways whether that's physical risk or like the risk you, you, you took it could be financial risk it could be legal risk it could be all sorts of things I mean, it's a slightly difficult question to answer because I, I, I suspect we become more risk averse as we get early, uh, older, and, and mm. I think I do. Um, uh, so separating that out from the sort of risk uh, environment. But certainly, I mean, there's people who just don't, um, y you know, they don't understand the context. So um, for an example, I, I don't think I'd, I'd do this now, and I didn't do it in South Africa, but in Zimbabwe at the time in 1988, if you wanted to get around in the rural areas, you hitched. I mean, you got a bus if a bus came, but I mean, that, that mm. could be a long time, and, and you hitched. Um, and, you know, and I was always, you know, picked up and people were kind and, and, and et cetera. But I do remember once being picked up by um, some South Africans, uh, and white South Africans. I mean, this was back in, in 1988, but presumably they were relatively progressive that they'd gone on holiday to um, to, to an independent Zimbabwe, but they picked us up and um, and, and were going um, along the same route as us. And um, they've seen perfectly nice people. But when we got to the point uh, of saying, oh, could you drop us here um, in this village? Um, was just off the main road. Um, I mean, they were like, you're crazy. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I remember one of the people saying, you know, these people will kill you. And I, I was like, um, <laughs> no, uh, but it was tragic because, um, in fact, we said to them, why don't you stop the car here, come to the bar? You will be welcomed with open arms. You know, you will be welcomed with op open arms. Uh, I think ESCOM has failed, Milton. Is it ESCOM? This this is a typical example of uh, uh, SCOM uh, playing tonight. Yes, yeah, so we suddenly lost power and our battery uh, supply <laughs> disappeared uh, so quickly today. Um, yeah, so apologies about that, but a problem. Well, so Patrick has been holding the fort, uh, man, <laughs> whilst you've been away. Oh, thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, Patrick is a star. Um, he 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 is a wonderful person who can step in uh, in place of ASCOM. Uh, <laughs> so um, I don't know where you were, um, uh, but you, you were talking about um, what students can learn when they are out in the field and and, and so on. Mm. Yeah, that's right. We were just talking a bit about sort of risk and um uh, you know I, I was just saying i never felt um sort of at risk where i was in zimbabwe i think we were obviously thoughtful and, and careful and i felt i felt the same when i was in I South Africa. That. but again you know one one just has to be sensible i guess and um i wanted to move to south africa and the work that you did there i mean working under nelson mandela's in the nelson mandela administration is by itself a great achievement and you worked in the uh uh mangosutu butelezi ministry uh, during the government of national unity or the gnu um, how 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 did you find that, and what lessons did you learn working under President Mandela? Well, I um, when I'd been in Zimbabwe, I had visited um, South Africa um, to attempt to see one of the, uh, the the father of one of the pupils who I who I taught. Which, um, but I was very really naive. I mean, I understood there was apartheid in South Africa, and it was a bad thing. But I didn't sort of realise, I mean, 1988, it was in its dying throes, but they were pretty vicious dying throes and there was a state of emergency, etc. cetera. Um, and um, so, uh, you know, I, 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 when I came back from Zimbabwe, I was absolutely passionate about, you know, the anti-apartheid movement. But I do remember when Nelson Mandela was released, I, I, I was a bit worried because I thought, you know, we built him up. And he used to go to the South Africa, the 24-hour picket outside the 
um, South African embassy and we used to, you know, sing songs about Nelson Mandela, etc. I thought he can't possibly live up to, you know, what he's been built up for. And of course, he was released and he and, and lived up to it and more uh, and, and was amazing. So uh, when the chance came as to to go and work with a project called the Westminster Foundation for Democracy um, uh, to, to work in the South African Parliament, it was uh, it was just an amazing privilege. And I um, and I leapt at it. Um, and yeah, being in that. Uh, you know, the, the last year of, of Mandela's presidency and the first year of, of Thabo Mbeki's that I was there was just a massive, it was a massive privilege. Um, you know, he, he's the absolute hero who I put on a pedestal and who and he stands far, far above it. But I mean, I guess, Milton, you were, I mean, I, I, I told you before when I, when I left South Africa that first time across the border, I'd, I'd written in a notebook, which I still have, you know, I, I will never go back to this country until it's changed. And, but that was April 1988 and it looked like, you know, that was not going to happen. And, and if it did, it would be through some terrible um, uh, uh, sort of cataclysm. And and at the time, the idea that, that um, Mandela was and, and, and all those just not being believed. So I just wonder also from your perspective, I mean, being in South Africa at the time, you know, how 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 you saw it and was it as as sort of dramatic and surprising a shift as, as it seemed to me or was it more obviously going that way anyway? Yeah, I think um, we, we were completely um, blown away by the dignity of Nelson Mandela. I mean, um, over the years, we were repeatedly told that the man is a terrorist and is bad news for the country and for the world. And uh, out on the 11th of February, 3 p.m. 1990, on a Sunday afternoon, he walks out of prison. And it's just this dignified. And I remember um, someone telling me a story that they were watching on TV with their daughter, um, and uh, and they said, oh, he, <laughs> why would they lock up such a dignified man? <laughs> Did he, you know, so that is exactly what happened, at least uh, to people like myself when we saw Nelson Mandela. Um, we didn't know really what to expect. And his opening line at that grand parade speech in Cape Town, I greet you in the name of peace. I mean, honestly, that was mind blowing. Um, and of course, to follow through and what Mandela preached day in, day out. I remember him telling us this, that um, um, he is part of a collective. He's not a messiah. He's not a saint. Um, he is just as fallible as everybody else because there was that danger, which is uh, in a way what you were thinking about, that he may not really lived up to the aura and um, so we thought that perhaps, uh, you know, that whole people sort of likening him to Jesus and so on. We were just worried that that would set him up for failure because his standards would be so unrealistically high. But actually, um, the integrity of the man, the dignity of the man, uh, particularly when he won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1993 alongside F.W. de Klerk, um, uh, it was just further proof that the world is seeing what we are seeing. Uh, mm. I, I was um, uh, I was challenged as a journalist because I was trained to be independent, and it's never about you; it's about the story. But um, I, I got um, uh, it. It was very hard to remain neutral uh, when you were in the presence of Nelson Mandela. Yeah. Well, I was very privileged because. The day he gave his last speech in Parliament um, as president, um, I think every every member of Parliament got one ticket, and there was a, a lady um, called Inka Mars who was a member of Parliament for the Inkata Freedom Party, and she had um, children and grandchildren. But I think she decided that if she gave it to one of them, she'd have to choose among them, and that would cause all sorts of difficulties. So to get round it, she gave the ticket to me which meant they could all at least be united in their um, anger at me. But anyway, it meant I was in the public gallery at that amazing, uh, just amazing e experience. And, um, you know, to hear the then National Party leader, you know, the old apartheid leader, um, 
you know, speaking in Fossa um, in praise of Mandela. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was at the ANC, you know, giving a standing ovation to him. I mean, it was a, they were they were heady heady times, very special times, and um, and I, I I will always remember them. Um, yeah. And of course, you uh, wrote in your uh, uh, memoir, I never promised you a rose garden about your experiences um, in uh, parliament, in, in, in the government in South Africa. If you are from Warwick University and you're coming out to volunteer, to teach in one of the toughest townships in South Africa, Alexandra Township, north of here, um, where Warwick is in five schools and uh, Patrick knows it very well by now um, and in some of the schools in Soweto where Warwick is. What would your advice be um, having that sort of vantage point uh, perspective on uh, working in a country like South Africa? Um, uh, well the first thing I think is um, you know, embrace it, uh, you know, understand that you'll be going in circumstances that are very different from what you're you're used to and then try and sort of, um, uh, you know, mold stuff into your world view. I mean, I think the most important thing was was listening to people, learning from people, you know, understanding context um, and, and making friendships um, and um, you know, I was lucky in, in the other two guys who came out to in, in, from England with me, who, who I think had a similar mindset to me. But I do know there were people, uh, there was one character who went out a year or two later who was very much of the sort of, well, I'm here to tell these people how things should be. Um, and that you know, obviously does not work out well. I, I think going in with the mentality of, you know, you are there, um, you are there to learn um, uh, to, 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 uh, as much as anything else um, and to learn from each other. I think that's that's the approach. Um, and I just found, and also I guess it's how you, how you put your mind. I mean, I, I just found that things were new and very different, different and some of them, you know, challenging. I was not used to washing in a river of freezing cold water in the morning. I mean, that was that was not but you know you can either go oh this is terrible or actually you can think well wow this is completely different and actually it's quite life affirming and um certainly wakes you up in the morning uh cured a few hangovers um but you know uh, th th there was also that sort of sense of of being part of of something and you know uh and these curious sort of figures who who would sit on the rocks and and wash their clothes um alongside everybody else it was curious at first and then um you know people just got on with it and accepted us as part of that community so i think i think that's that's the spirit to go into it but don't don't try and make it shape it to how things are back home because the whole point is to go and and understand different perspectives and different experiences. Yeah, and I think that's the last thing I'd say is, you know, I understand why people have different perspectives from you. It's not because they're wrong, it's because they've lived life from different perspectives and it's really worth understanding. Them. Well, thank you very much. Um, I think it is at this point, which uh, feels right, um, that perhaps we should take a few questions from the audience, um, perhaps they could uh, uh, cover areas where we hadn't uh, really touched on. There is so much to talk about and uh, so much little time. So um, Marianne, do we have uh, any questions uh, coming forward? Uh, I'm just changing the settings so that people can switch their microphones on and the cameras on. So we've we're ready to take questions. Um, there isn't anything in the chat just yet, um, but I know that we've got a really mixed audience of staff, students, donors, alumni, uh, and even some of our teachers in Africa. So we'd welcome questions from any of you. Um, don't be shy. <laughs> and one of the most fantastic things about the Warwick in Africa program, of course, is the idea that um, 
the teachers from the ground uh, go back to Warwick to learn how mm -hmm. they can then uh, make the program sustainable once the UK students are back um, at home so that um, the teachers in the local schools with the uh, extra skills that they get from the Warwick program can continue on their own and share not just with their students but with other uh, teachers their colleagues alongside them as well uh, we've seen quite uh, powerful um, uh, relationships grow um, out of that experience so we've had one question in the chat and I, I guess I can answer that because it's how can we join Warwick and Africa programme? I think it's a question from an undergraduate student. Um, so if you want to get involved, the um, well, we were intending to open the applications for these this year's summer placements in Africa on the 10th of January, but obviously we are considering still the situation um, and whether or not we'll be able to travel again this year. We've had to cancel twice now. Um, but we are now trying to build a work in Africa community because, of course, there are other ways which you can get involved with us that are based in the UK. We've had lots of students doing research projects. Um, we can offer some work experience placements. We've got all sorts of things, events and activities. And what we'd really like to do is build a community over time and with anyone who's interested, really, not just student staff and um, so we're trying to do that through social media and a, ma a mailing list, but also bringing people together in actual events like this. Um, so that's how you can get involved. I would just suggest initially just join um, follow us on social media and join the mailing list in the first instance, and then you'll get to hear about things. Um, I said it, I did see one of our African teachers, I think, appear on the screen. Have you got a question? I don't know which one it was. Or perhaps Magdalena, I know you're in the audience. Would you like to, um, Milton was talking about the study programme. Would you like to tell, talk a little bit about how, when you came to the UK? I think we've got a hand, Robert MacDonald. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, you can hear you. Thanks very much for the talk. Um, a question for Lord Oates and also, also Milton. Um, We've seen over the last couple of weeks, well, the last week, um, with the finding of this new variant, a kind of situation of uh, shooting the messenger. So it was found and identified and shown to the world by South Africa. And then there was a kind of big knee jerk reaction where, you know, tra travel restrictions were imposed specifically on Southern Africa. Why do you think it is that that happened? And what, in your view, would be a more sensible response than what actually did happen? Um. Shall I go first and then we'll, I, 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 um, I think the reason it happened um, is because uh, particularly in the UK I and mean, the UK imposed the first ban um, because the government had been seen to be very um, behind the curve early on in the pandemic. I think that's one of the reasons they acted like that. I'm afraid I think there is a prejudice um, uh, there um, which um, is of these dangerous things that have come out of Africa, just ban that. I mean, as I said to the, the, the minister in, in the House of Lords on Monday, what sort of signal does it send uh, to countries around the world if a country like South Africa, with its excellent science and its exemplary transparency, discovers a variant, informs the WHO exactly as it's supposed to do immediately, and the result is, absolutely devastating economic consequences of a travel ban. I mean, I think it's unconscionable. And um, if, if I, I mean, I, I question whether that actually needed to be imposed, but if they really felt it did to, to have to be imposed, then um, the, the UK is the president of the G7, um, uh, you know, group of, of, of the most economically wealthy countries in the world. Uh, we did summon immediately a meeting of the G7 health ministers. We should have summoned a meeting of the G7 economy ministers uh, uh, with the South Africans and other regional leaders 
and said, well, if we are going to do this, and again, I, I do question whether it's it's necessary, but then how are we going to help support the industries that are are suffering and the people who who rely on them? Um, so that's what I would have done. The other thing I would have done is immediately um, I got those um, health ministers together to agree on a IP waiver, intellectual property waiver on vaccines so that, that they can actually get um, to many of these countries. Instead, we, 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 we're punishing South Africa for doing the right thing. Plus, we're doubling down on the booster program here in the UK, you know, at, at a time when many people in the region in Southern Africa haven't even had one. And, and that is, I think, morally wrong. But I also think it is very stupid because if you want to stop new variants emerging, we want to get off this, this treadmill we've been on for the last two years then you better get people vaccinated rather than just keep stuffing more stuff uh, into your own veins because it, it'll be it'll be never ending. No, that's very true. And um, uh, the inconsistency is what people are questioning um, with the travel ban, particularly by the UK, with the first, um, Robert, because for instance, it's now transpired that this uh, uh, variant was in the Netherlands uh, long before the South Africans had actually put that whole uh, genome sequencing for it. Uh, but the Netherlands is not banned by the UK. Okay, now that is inconsistent. Okay, because uh, you can see where the prejudice lies and you can see, you know, the knock-on effect. So the connection is, if you go to a COP26 summit and you say, we support developing countries to move from fossil fuels to clean energy, how will they believe you if you are behaving like this on uh, a pandemic? Okay, so, so there is a lot of uh, connecting the dots on how, uh, you know, uh, uh, former colonial powers, uh, try to say we're all the same, we're in the Commonwealth, everybody's equal, but actually uh, what's going on in practice, it's not. And that's what the debate in South Africa tonight is all about because it now uh, has emerged that the, the virus was in many other countries uh, before uh, South Africa and those countries were not immediately banned when that information became available. Right, thank you. Thanks, Robert, for that question. Um, I think Magdalena has got her hand up. Um, so, Magdalena, do you want to, were you going to ask a question or did you want to just talk a bit about your experience working with us? I'm not going to ask a question, but to talk a little bit about my experience, especially about the study program of Ricky. Thank you. Can I carry on? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm Magda Tewele from Morogoro, Tanzania. I'm a work in Africa lead teacher. I would like to share with you a little bit about my experience of a study program where the work in Africa took us to England to the University of Warwick. It was a, it was a great experience to be in a university that we are working with the, the program. Because when people asking us, are you working with, what is working in Africa? It added us something that at least we've been there. During the, we had, uh, we had two weeks where we had a chance to visit some schools in Warwick. I remember some schools like uh, Farnham and the, and the Edward schools. We went there. We enter into classes to observe teaching and learning in England. That was an amazing experience that he brought us home with the new techniques of uh, teaching and learning. Apart from learning from the um, England, from uh, England classes, then we got a chance to learn from one another. 
culture and we share a lot from my fellow lead teachers who came from South Africa and Ghana. At the end of the day, I found that it is possible to change the world because I thought I had the problems with my community, with my school, but when I hear the story from my fellow teachers, it was a wonderful stories, especially when I heard about South African classes before I went to South Africa, it was like a nightmare. I couldn't imagine how uh, how it's hard to teach in South Africa when it comes to behavior of learners. But um, later on, work in Africa gave us a chance to visit South Africa, and we wit I witness what is going on in their classes. At the end of the day, we build a long relationship among lead teachers and work in Africa, where we, together we are trying to solve our daily challenges of teaching and learning in our community, in our schools. That is a short about my experience. Thanks, Magdalena. That was great. Um, do, do any of the, I, I don't think that I can see any other questions. Um, so I was just wondering if any of our other teachers would like to talk a little bit about how things are now um, during the COVID pandemic, because I know it's been a very difficult few years for you. Um, how, is, how is teaching at the moment? What are the challenges that you've found during the pandemic? Is anyone willing to talk about that? There's one from Dylan Davis, I think, um, in, the in, in the chat. Um, thank you for such an insightful talk. My question is, what are the most important skills that you have developed from these experiences abroad that you can take back into the world of work and study? Lord Oates. I, I think, I hope, um, how to um, how to show both humility and strength. Um, uh, uh, you know, that's that's often not a, a combination, but I think I think that's something I really learned from people. Very strong, very determined um, uh, people, um, uh, uh, and and I and and, and I took that from there. Um, I think understanding uh, that there are different perspectives in the world from mine and that they are equally valid uh, and they come from experience of life. I think that's been really important um, uh, to me. And then, you know, the enduring nature of, of friendship, um, despite all the sort of superficial, you know, differences that may exist. You know, my my strongest and most enduring friendships are from from Zimbabwe um, it, back in that time. I have also some incredible uh, friendships from 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 South Africa as well. You know, the sort of people who, you know, uh, when push comes to the shove, they stand by you in the most difficult um, of, of circumstances. And I think, um, you know, learning about each other and different perspectives, that's a that is uh, absolutely in, invaluable insight, and, and it's helped sort of shape my life certainly. And I've 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 had a great great gift from it. I just had a quick question: Have have you found along the way in your career? Have you talked about your experiences, articulated them in any, you know, when you've been going for jobs or positions? Do you think it's helped you? To give it to sort of give an example of um, these skills that you say that you. Yes, I mean, I d it definitely has um, come up in, in interviews and and certainly, um, you know, any of the people who've, who've worked with me can tell you that I'll, I'll bore on about <laughs> about the amazing experiences of Zimbabwe and South Africa and Ethiopia. You know, um, <laughs> Don't get me started. Um, but no, I mean, ye yes, it has really. I think um, because because it gave me um, a, 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 an experience of really being tested 
I tested having to show leadership skills, having to show that I could adapt to circumstances um, and and I, I could deal with and you know with with sort of situations that I was I was not used to at all and I could, could, could adapt to them. So uh, I think that's always been um, useful, uh, useful for me. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I, I'd, I'd say um, it, it, it was a great, it, it, it's been a great thing in my career, but the most important thing has kind of been what it's given me in my soul, I think, um, because that is, that that is the gift to, to me that, that will be with me forever. Um, you know, even when I'm long retired and sat in my rocking chair and not having to worry about careers, I will, uh, I, I will never forget those um, experiences. Thank you. There's, a, there's another one, Marianne, from Paul. Um, he's asking, and this probably could be you or Patrick or somebody else who want to answer this. How can Warwick in Africa ensure those in the UK remain engaged with the work they have done once they have left university and the Warwick in Africa program? I mean, this is in part what you've just answered, Lord Oates, that you are still very much in contact even after those many years. Yeah, I, I would say if, if Paul means um, how can you sort of keep in touch with the programme and, and follow its progress, then that's what we're trying to achieve by creating more of a community um, which includes alumni. Um, and that's that's part of the idea. And, and it was an alum, it was two alumni that actually sort of expressed the, the idea initially because they felt they'd been so involved during their time at, at Warwick. And then obviously when you leave Warwick, you don't get to hear about how it's progressing and, and keep in touch with the with the programme. And, and so that is part of the idea about keeping in touch through the community. Um, any more questions? I just have one more about international development. Um, how do you feel at the moment about the UK's approach to international development? Obviously, we're being stingy, aren't we, at the moment? Well, I am, um, uh, you know, one of the things that inspired me to get involved in politics was um, that I really felt that, you know, given the way we had um, gone around uh, the world in the past, that maybe we could um, uh, contribute a bit of the wealth, much of which came from the exploitation um, of of those countries. And I was, and that's one of the reasons I got involved in the politics and the party I got involved with, because it was the party that, you know, first adopted this UN target and, and campaigned most openly. But, um, you know, this isn't the classic case of, um, you know, we we campaigned. You know, people in political parties, not just mine, but but, but the Labour Party, and subsequently, actually, even then, the Conservative Party. But but more to the point, people in in, in churches, people of all sorts of faiths, and, and of men and NGOs. Um, and you know, in 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 1988, when the government had consistently cut overseas aid down to about 0.27 percent, I think, of our, our national wealth. Uh, the idea we'd ever get to sort of 0.7 percent was crazy. It was now people just why do you waste your time? Um, and this is the thing I'd say about politics generally. If you believe in something, don't let anybody tell you it's not achievable. Because if anybody, you know, nothing that nothing's that that's been achieved um, uh, was done without without struggle, without normally being ridiculed, etc. You know, you talk to the suffragettes or the chartists or well, that or, or today, you know, today is the 65th, is it? Or I can't remember the exact date of of that day on which Rosa Parks, you know, said, no, I will not get up from this seat on this bus in Montgomery. And, you know, that that young pastor Martin Luther King said, right, we're going to start this boycott. And everybody told you, you know, you couldn't move things. And of course, there's still a hell of a long way to go for proper racial justice in the United States, but my God, it's different uh, in those states than it was, um, it would be it that there's a long way to go. So, um, so you know, that's, that's 
a, a, a kind of point that I would make about about sort of that struggle. But anyway, uh, back to the actual question you asked me. Um, you know, I was lucky enough to be in the government when we delivered that 0.7%. We also thought we'd delivered an act of parliament to prevent the current government from ever reversing it, but it, it turned out it had some holes in it. But, you know, I, I think it was absolutely unconscionable to because the aid budget was going to fall anyway, the actual amount we gave because our economy had shrunk. And that was the point. It reflected our wealth. Uh, so it would have gone down anyway, but at the same time, we cut it massively and at a time when people were in most need and where most countries were increasing, uh, their, most wealthy countries increasing their aid budget. So kind of don't get me started uh, on the aid budget. We are going to campaign, campaign, campaign and, and, and make the government pay the price for betraying that promise because it was an absolute promise uh, to some of the, the, you know, the, the people in the world who most need support at this moment and it was broken and it's outrageous. Thank you. Has anybody else got any questions? Milton or? Um... Yeah, I, I, thank you, Marianne. I wanted to move it forward a little bit because I suppose in the end, when you start volunteering as a young person, a teenager who goes to Ethiopia and so on and Zimbabwe, um, it leads to uh, much greater things in uh, later uh, life because, for instance, uh, Lord Oates, you not only stopped in Zimbabwe and South Africa and Ethiopia, you became the chief of staff in the deputy prime minister's uh, office. Um, you know, uh, that, that's quite sort of, the, that's where you were going when you went to Ethiopia, uh, when you were 15. You know, you, you were destined to that sort of uh, uh, contribution to not just to East and Southern Africa, but to the UK itself. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I, I think the thing uh, and it reflects what I said earlier, you know, if you believe in something, you know, stick at it, go for it, um, learn along the way. You know, have that humility to 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 learn and that strength to 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 learn. But learn along the way, and and things can happen. You know, I I was always told, you know, when I when I was 17 and I joined the, what was then the Liberal Party here, and I, and I think we were sort of three percent in the polls and within the margin of error, our existence within the margin. And people told me, you're wasting your time. Why don't you? You'll never be in government. Well, you know, we were. I mean, can then say, well, I'll admit. In fact. I must tell you an anecdote that while I, when, when the coalition government was formed in, in 2010, because there was a government of national unity that had been formed in Zimbabwe after, um, you know, the terrible violence in that 2008 election. And my, my um, dear friend Morgan Mendy Mutsira sent me a, a text message or a WhatsApp message or whatever we did back in, in 2010 saying, oh, I see now got a coalition government like we have in Zimbabwe and I and I said to him well I hope it's going to be a bit more good-natured although I, I can't help reflecting that um, the coalition government in the UK ended as disastrously for my party as it, as the Zimbabwean one did for for the MDC but anyway um, but that that's an aside but no I I, I really think um, uh, I the, the experiences I had from the, whether it was in Ethiopia and Zimbabwe in, in, in South Africa and subsequently from the relationships that I developed, you know, really did, did, did sort of help me focus on, on what, what I wanted to, what I wanted to do. Okay, well, if there's no further questions, I don't think there's any in the chat or anything I think we'll draw it to a close do you have any final closing remarks Milton oh yeah um I'll, I'll leave the last word for Lord Oates but I just want to say what an evening it's been uh, including my lights off shows you <laughs> real life never really escapes you even when you're on the internet with uh, Warwick University um and Lord Oates um, I'm so grateful to Patrick for uh, being uh, the leader in uh, all of this program and also for holding the fort while I was in darkness. 
Um, thank you, thank you very much, Patrick. And um, Lord Oates, I am uh, absolutely thrilled that uh, we got to do this. Uh, I can't wait for us to have uh, another session, uh, perhaps over a cup of tea or maybe something stronger, uh, I might add, uh, given the stresses of the pandemic. But uh, thank you so much. I've learned so much about your own experience and can't wait to see you here back on the land of the free. <laughs> well, th th thank you so much, Milton. It's it's been a real um, privilege to talk with you, and, and and thank you everybody who's 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 come. I, I I just say one last thing, which is, you know, if you have a chance to go, whether it's to 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 go to Tanzania or Ghana or or, or, or South Africa, go, go. You will have a fantastic experience and. Um, uh, and and I'm, I believe you will learn a, a huge amount about it. And um, Milton, um, uh, uh, as I said, actually, when you were off, when ESCOM had uh, cut you off, I am, um, you know, it's, it's a real privilege to be with you because, of course, you, you, you know, um, Milton is a great uh, sort of figure in South Africa and, and broadcasting and, and a, a privilege. And I can tell you, as soon as we get this travel ban lifted, I'm going to be up over there. And we'll have a drink with you, uh, hopefully in Johannesburg, and, and see all my my dear friends again because it's been such a long time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne, for arranging. Um, great idea, and uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks yes, thank for so coming and thanks for speaking. Okay, I'll leave. You. We'll all leave now. <laughs> Take care. Cheers. Bye. Bye.